If you want to instantly boost your strength and acquire new PRs for your next workout, then you need to try these following hacks. The first being alternating between pushing and pulling movements in the same session. See, if you're running an upper lower or a specialized split where say a chest and back workout is performed, you may find that doing one muscle in completion followed by the other right after results in both areas being weaker. When the easiest solution in the world is to simply alternate back and forth. Complement the movement patterns, you're still doing the exact same workout. Zero differences, but the order allows for more overall rest time and the systemic fatigue to be less of an issue because let's keep it real. I don't care who you are. If you completely fry your chest to the great beyond and then attempt to do weighted pull-ups right after, you'll always be weaker. And this is not an issue of work capacity, you're just tired. And in many cases, if guys were to wait a couple hours, try to do some pull-ups again, they'd find that they're a little bit stronger. So instead of doing that, performing two-a-days, how about you change the exercise order? Make it equivalent because it works on both ends. If you do an incline press immediately followed by an overhead press, your front delts aren't going to be as strong and therefore you might have to drop the low by a good five to 10 pounds as well as losing a couple repetitions. Whereas if you would have just included a row in between, you'd find that you get at least an additional nine minutes of rest between those two movements. And that can make all the difference. You're essentially getting that power lifter effect without waiting around. You won't get cold or lose your groove, just that on the next movement, you're gonna be that much stronger. It's almost as if you can match the performance of doing those same exercises earlier on. Meaning, it doesn't matter if you're favoring vertical or horizontal first. Either way, there will be far less of a drop off. The bleeding effect isn't as noticeable. And that's all I'm trying to stress. Not that you'll be 100% fresh or not feel weaker at all, just that you're able to bring your best version every single time. And this is the simplest way to do it. At the same time, it completely solves the laziness issue. No longer will the later half of your workout be half-assed since accountability is forced and you literally feel stronger. Secondly, let's talk about excessively warming up, which is plaguing the lifting community. Stop with these 15 to 20 minute rituals of doing light dumbbell and band work with some mobility drills that maybe aren't applicable to you right now because you haven't been injured in those respective areas. Not saying that it's bad to do this kind of stuff, just that it's probably unnecessary in making you slightly weaker while wasting time. You can get away with just warming up with the movement you're trying to hit. Now the thing is, even that tends to be screwed up where way too many ramp ups and reps are done. So an easy recommendation is to probably cut your reps in half as you're climbing to that starting weight, as well as reducing the jumps. This is not ramping sets or pyramid training. If you're doing straight sets, the warmups should not resemble a workout. So let me give you an example. If you want to incline bench two plates for reps, it might look like this. Two sets of 10 with an empty bar, one to two sets of five with a plate, one set of three with a plate and a half, and then boom, two plates for a three by 10, whatever rep range you selected. Is that long or difficult to do? No. Within 10 minutes tops, you'll already be ready to kick some ass. Notice how the warm-up reps are not equivalent to the target zone. So if I'm doing sets of 10, I might half that when I'm warming up. And the closer I get to my starting load, the more the reps are gonna drop, even if I'm not doing low reps for that session. So you go from 10s to 5s to 3s. You don't just maintain 10 all the way through. And certainly, you don't need reps of 20 to warm up because that's another thing that I see guys doing. Or reps of 15, that's way too high. The only time I would ever do that is with an empty bar. By the way, the stronger you are, the bigger the jumps can be, especially for squats and deadlifts. If you're in between the fours and fives, you could jump a plate at a time, no problem. So you gotta look at percentages, even though you're probably not gonna calculate it in that way. Oh, and after those straight sets are completed, the next movements don't need a Thor warm-up. You can go directly into those heavier weights or at least make rapid weight jumps, like 50% and then all out to what you were trying to target. So if I'm gonna do OHP as a second movement, my delts and tries are already super warm 
from the previous rep work. And so I might just do empty bar for 10 reps, followed by 135 for three, and then directly into my work weight. And that's gonna take less than five minutes. Same thing goes for isolations. If you're gonna dumbbell curl 45 pounds, do one set of 10 with the 20s, and you're good to go. Warming up should be way faster than the workout itself. And in many cases, you can just keep jumping and having no rest in between. Because by the time you take one plate, slide on the sleeves, clip it on, get your setup right, a minute's already passed by. And because the loads are so submaximal, you can just keep banging it out. And that's what's actually gonna get your pump to a good spot, even though you're not tired. So pick up the pace, go less crazy with the reps, and you'll be a bit stronger for the sets that actually matter for creating a hypertrophic stimulus. Thirdly, whenever trying to produce maximum force, we always have to look at an exercise and ask, how can we make this even more stable? Even if the correction is very subtle, motor unit recruitment will be highest and therefore produce more strength and size. So that could be as simple as grabbing onto a power rack or anything stationary while you do a single arm overhead press. This significantly reduces the balance component and makes your core work less hard, which is good if the goal is to strengthen the vertical press itself and build those delts. Now, if you're a strongman competitor and you wanna specifically get better at the circus press, or in general, you're refining the old school movement, then do them like that. But in a generalized context, AKA what's valid for 90% of you watching right now, find creative ways of reducing instability. You never want core strength and balance and an inefficient movement pattern to affect force production. Same thing holds for press arounds, one arm dumbbell rows, which everyone figured out intuitively. One arm dumbbell curls, same thing. You're either holding two dumbbells, which evens out your center of mass, or you're grabbing onto something. And then there's what we lay down on or prop that given muscle against. So in the case of curls, having a preacher pad, having your arms be braced behind you, which can be a seated dumbbell curl or a nice little hack, doing it in the lap pull down station, such that your arms are pressed against those little pads. For overhead press, you're not standing up. You're seated, pressing the upper back into the pads. We reverse it, trying to work the back muscles. Guess what? Now our chest is on the pad. That's the whole benefit of a chest supporter row. It's not just the fact that we're taking out the spinal rectors, it's that we're creating more stability. Heck, this even applies to lap pull downs. Why do you think your knees are locked in? It's to prevent you from going up at the same time, maximizing stability. Because technically, if I use a weight that's less than my body weight, and that can be a huge percentage of lifters, or let's say I'm using a similar load, I can do it sitting down on the floor and I won't go totally up, but I'll be weaker 100% of the time due to the lack of stability. Same thing if you're trying to do a cable row while standing up. Technically, if you stagger your stance and pull, you're not gonna tip forward. Like You'll be able to do the exercise, but if you were to prop your feet on those giant pads or even a power rack like what we see in my ghetto setup, you find that you instantly become way stronger. Anytime you can make an exercise more stable, it'll be more effective, even if it already was a great mass builder. You're just taking things up a notch. And if you don't have access to some of these setups I'm talking about, which usually just requires an adjustable bench for the most part, well, there's even bands. You can find weird ways of anchoring yourself, such that the counter forces keep you in place, which I have seen Coach Kasim do on his rows. You know, one final example I can give is using the pads on your adjustable bench. Even though that's designed for decline pressing, why not anchor your shins on them even when you're doing things like inclines and overhead press. You're not getting leg drive out of it by aggressively pressing the feet into the ground. All it is, is the chimney effect. And actually at many gyms, you'll see that they do feature a little foot rest. That's the reason. Fourthly, if you wanna maintain your strength throughout the entire workout and have repeatable sets, then please refrain from going to failure for everything. This will have you going from the top end of a rep range all the way down to the bottom in a quick amount of time. So if you're doing three sets of six to 10, your first might be 10. Of course, all out, brutal, you're making faces, you're grinding. We're talking about true failure here. And then the second set, you might get no more than seven repetitions. And the third, 
about six. When, if you would have left a few reps in the tank, one to two, let's keep it basic. I'm not even gonna suggest the lower RPEs, which are probably an excellent choice if you keep yourself accountable. And this is how many modern powerlifters are training. Let's not even do that and just get super freaking close to failure, but not totally at it. This slight correction makes it very realistic in you sustaining your overall performance. Reps might not drop at all, or if they do, it'll be quite minimal. And this is exactly what you've seen in my workout videos. You can do the same thing. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're gonna be at the highest extreme for every set, but you'll be much closer to it. In other words, closing the gap. You might get 10-10-9, or 10-9-8, or 10-8-8, or 10-8-7. Look at the modern strength athletes who train this way, which is pretty much all of them, and enjoy having higher quality sets with a better stimulus to fatigue ratio, which means you'll not only feel refreshed, but gain similar amounts of muscle. So what's there not to love? This is win, win. Just use some reps in reserve. It's not difficult. Don't be like those older guys who are resistant to recommending it because we know it's a great tool. And like I said, we can simplify to one rep in reserve if you really have a hard time with this. So that's it, if your goal is maximum strength, Stop going to failure for all your compounds. Finally, to see your strength permanently boost for every upcoming session, simply rest more between sets. This is a no-brainer and practiced by every modern strength athlete. One to two minutes between sets is outdated. Only preached by bodybuilders and old school powerlifters who simply didn't know better. The whole idea was to raise work capacity and overall conditioning, which allows you to tolerate higher workloads and be more efficient. So you're in and out of gym in 45 minutes. Problem is, it doesn't work in a physical sense because the high threshold motor units don't have a chance to fully recover. And this is something I talked about extensively in this recent video, so be sure to check it out because I'm not gonna overly repeat myself. But if you wanna be really strong, ensure that your reps drop way less on a set per set basis, similar to reps in reserve, then you should be 100% ready, maybe even slightly more. And if that means resting an additional minute to ensure victory, then go for it. Never should you question failing the target rep zone if you knew you were capable of more. Rest intervals is like reps in reserve in terms of what it does to your total repetitions. If you approach it the wrong way, reps will drop unnecessarily during the following sets. Whereas if you do it correctly, while not going to complete failure, man, you're gonna have way more PRs in the coming weeks, months, and years. Forget about this macho attitude that your muscles are a burning furnace and that you're gasping your life away. This isn't rib cage expansion. You're not doing 20 rep breathing squats. By the way, for those who ask about rest pause and drop sets, that's a whole other video, but know that they still don't beat straight sets and in a strength training context, they're not typically recommended to begin with. Just rest more, which might be an average of three minutes. But for the harder movements that really break it down, it could be four to five. And for one rep maxes, I've seen some guys creep it up to eight. Not saying I'm suggesting that, but in a generalized context, know that it's going to be longer rather than shorter. That's all I'm trying to say. You can figure out the rest. And keep in mind, there's always antagonist supersets, which automatically reduce your rest time even though you're constantly moving. So if I prescribe two minutes of rest, it actually is gonna be around three. Because as you move on to the next exercise, you're setting up, catching your breath, it ends up equating. And then if you follow the push-pull template I talked about earlier, then some of those easier movements can be supersetted. So it's not like I'm telling you to rest three minutes between your sets of barbell curls and do absolutely nothing. No, you can do a push down as well. Like this is what I do in my workout video. So overall, my five hacks complement each other, therefore still saving you time. And that's it. Let me know your tricks on instantly buffing up. I'll see you in the next video.